Let's take a moment to pause and take a deep breath. Focus on his presence. Acknowledge that he's with you. It might just be an awareness. It might be in the form of a prayer that says, Lord, I'm here. Speak to me. I'm listening. Just come as you are. Maybe use your imagination. Imagine what he is like. Imagine his kind face. Maybe imagine his arms around you. What do you need? Do you need a, a hug from him? Maybe imagine what that would be like. Maybe you need to release control of some things and surrender. Sometimes what I do, I, I just open my hands. It's a prompt to myself that I'm letting go of things. So Jesus, as we come before you, Take a moment to pause and breathe slowly. To focus our scattered senses on your presence. We allow our senses to sense you. We acknowledge who you are by faith. We acknowledge the things that we need. worship you. Jesus, Lord of heaven, I do not deserve the grace that you have given. promise of your Lord I stand in wonder of the sacrifice you made with mercy beyond measure you have given, the grace that you have given, or the promise of your word, or the promise of your word. Lord, I stand in wonder, Lord, I stand in wonder of the promises you've made, of the promises you made. With mercy beyond measure, with mercy beyond measure, my debt you freely paid, my debt. 
you freely pay. Your love is deeper. Your love is deeper than any ocean, than any ocean. Higher, higher than the heavens, than the heavens reach it. Beyond the stars in the sky, beyond the stars in the sky. Sing it again. Your love is deeper. Your love is deeper than any ocean, than any ocean. Higher, higher than the heavens, than the heavens reach it. Beyond the stars in the sky, beyond the stars in the sky. Jesus, your love has no bounds. Jesus, your love has no bounds. Jesus, your love. Jesus, your love has no bounds. Jesus, your love has no bounds. Jesus, your love has no bounds. Your love is deeper than any ocean. It's higher. sky. Jesus, your love has no bounds. 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 shadow of death your perfect love is casting out fear and even though I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life I won't turn back I know you are near and I will fear no evil for my God is with If my God is with me, whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? Oh no, you never let go through the calm and through the storm. Oh no, you never let go in every high, every low. Oh no, you never let go, Lord, you never let go of me. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of man, your perfect love is casting out fear. Even though I'm caught, even though I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back. I know you are near. I will fear no evil. I will fear no evil. For my God is with me. For my God is with me. my God is with me. Whom shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? Sing it to him. Oh no. Oh no. You never let go through the calm and through the storm. Oh no. You never let go in every high, every low. Oh no. You never let go. Lord, you never let go of me. I can see a light, and I can see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on. And there will be an end to your troubles, but until that day comes, yeah, still I will praise you, still I will praise you. Say, oh no, you never let go. Oh no, you never let go. 
flow through the calm and through the storm. Oh no, you never let go in every high, every low. Oh no, you never let go, Lord, you never let go of me. Oh Lord, you never let go of me. No, you won't, you'll never let go of me. Can we see that? Yeah. Psalms 131, 1 through 3. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up, my eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Father, thank you for your beautiful, multicultural, intergenerational family gathering today in so many countries. Revive and sanctify us, I pray. Make us a house of prayer for all nations and set our hearts on fire again with the good news of your gospel. I take a moment now to think and to pray for my local church. It's borrowed ray that in thy sunshine's blaze its day may brighter fairer be rejoice my heart rejoice my soul my savior God has come to thee rejoice my heart you've been made by love that will not let me go. Oh joy, oh joy that seeks me through the pain. I cannot close my heart to thee. I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain. I trace the rainbow through the rain. I feel the promise is not vain. I feel the promise is not vain. That morn. That morn shall tearless be. Rejoice, rejoice my heart. Rejoice my soul. My Savior God has come to thee. Rejoice my heart. You've been made whole by love that will not let me go. Oh, love that will not let me go. that lifts and holds my head I dare not ask to fly from thee 
I lay in dust like glory dead That from the ground there blossoms red The life that shall endless be Rejoice Rejoice my heart Rejoice my soul My Savior God has come to thee Rejoice my heart You've been made whole by love that will not let me go. Oh, love that will not let me go. Oh, love that will not let me go. Lord, I'm remembering all the times I've sinned against you and against others. This week, in thought and deed, and I want to take this time now to confess those sins to you, and through that, be restored to relationship with you and accept that forgiveness that you freely offer. darkest hour, you raise me up from death to life now, in resurrection power, oh, your love is strong, oh, your love is strong, oh, your love is strong. Yes, your love is strong, and your love, it vanquished all my enemies, it broke the cage that silenced me, and set this songbird free. strong. 
love is strong. Sing it out. Your love is strong. Oh, your love is strong. Oh, your love is strong. Oh, your love is strong. Thank you, God, for your love that is never-ending, everlasting, unbreakable, forever love. Jesus, encounter us right where we're at today. We need you. We need to be refreshed in you. We need to be spoken to by you. We're here to abide in you. And I pray that you would use each one of us to keep speaking, to keep moving near as we move near to you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Wow, that's hot. Announcement one, the coffee is scolding hot. So better that than cold, I think. You know what I mean? You following me? Uh, I saw a few years ago, I saw a commercial where there was this homeless guy uh, that had this sign that said, anything helps. And someone gave him um, a coffee cup that said AM, PM coffee on it. And he took a drink of the coffee and he goes like that. And the, the camera froze on his sour face. And then these letters came and said, Seattle, where even the homeless are snobs about their coffee. I thought that's really funny. Not too hot, not too cold. Um, Welcome to Calvary Wallingford. For those of you that are visiting, welcome to here. I know those of you that are visiting. I've got friends, Andrew and Selah Noor, that are here visiting, who grew up in my youth group and uh, fell in love in my youth group and now are married out of my youth group. And they're here visiting today, so that's really special. And Josh's brother, Josh has been coming for a while. We were going to interview Josh today, but we're going to push it out till next week, so... Uh, stay tuned to get to know someone new. Or in the meantime, you could start talking today. Um, after church, we've got lunch. And what we have for lunch is pulled pork barbecue sandwiches. You guys are, I know a few of you can't stay. You've got some stuff going on afterwards. And I, I can see you going, oh, man. And we've got coleslaw. And for those of you that are vegan slash vegetarian, we have got something that looks like pulled pork. It looks exactly like pulled pork, except it's jackroot. Jackfruit, which is better than the root, I think. Yeah, so it tastes like root too. Is that what you said? It tastes like pulled pork. It actually does. So there you go. So it's, we have quite the meal today. It's going to be awesome. Make sure you stick around for that. The whole point in having lunch after service is that we can get to know each other. We were just talking with a few of you before. Getting to know one another doesn't really happen in a setting like this. You come in, you sit down, we sing a few songs, we have a little meet and greet while we get some treats, and then we kind of go right back into the service. And if we just ended it there, uh, we wouldn't really know each other. And that's not church. Church is being a community together and knowing one another so a few of us have endeavored to provide some yummy stuff for us to sit down and enjoy one another. If you can't stay, totally understand, but we're doing it every week. So may plan on next week or the week after, and um, it's, it's a really good time. Uh, what else am I supposed to say? Do you have any announcements slide up there? Oh, um, Women's Book Club. Um, Nicole is leading a book club for, for women. They're going through C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy right now. The book that they're on is um, Perilandra. And um, you, it's not too late to jump in. They're going to meet sometime in October. Um, I don't know if she's decided on the date or the, the when and the where yet, but <clears throat> the books are about this small. It's not, it is not hard to, to get caught up even now. Except the last book is actually quite, bit, quite a bit bigger. But the first two books are, are about that small. Easy reading and an incredible book. Incredible series. C.S. Lewis, it's um, one of my favorites of Lewis's fiction. Um, even more than uh, 
uh, than the Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe for me. So anyways, I hope, to, I hope you get jumped in with that. That's really fun. And another great idea for uh, you ladies um, getting to know one another. And I know Nicole's heart, even if you don't read the book, um, you're welcome to come out to the, they're going to have like a luncheon type of a thing where they'll talk about things. You're welcome to come and join that even if you, don't, you decide not to read the book. Um, <clears throat> we're starting a hermeneutics class. It, we will be doing this October 14th at Calvary Ballard in their office area there. They've got this big table. Um, I'll have some handouts for you so you'll need some space to write and things like that. And we'll be going through some, some activities together. That's on October 14th at Calvary Ballard, starts at 6 o'clock, and it will be every other Friday. Not every Friday, but every other Friday starting at 6 o'clock. Um, it'll be upstairs. Yeah, upstairs. Um, and we will learn the art. Hermeneutics is the science of how to study, interpret ancient texts. That's what that is. This is not a preaching class. We will not be covering how to preach or how to, how to uh, that's a homiletics. Homiletics is then basically answers the question, now how am I going to say what I just learned? How, what's the best way to say it? That's a, that's a completely different subject, although related. That's, that's not what this is. This is just to learn to study the Word of God either on your own, for your family, um, or if you're leading a Bible study or want to lead a study uh, or something like that. Or if, you're, if you want to someday exercise a gift to preach, to present, this would be a good starting class for you. And then um, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll launch a homiletics class after for those that are interested and we'll show you how to present and do all those types of things as well. But this is for study. You know, the Bible really calls all of us to be workmen who know how to rightly divide the word of truth. That means that there is a wrong way to divide the word of truth. And if you're a dad or a mom and you're trying to lead your kids through the Bible, there is a wrong way to lead your kids through the Bible and there's a right way to guide them through the Bible. Um, so if you're at that level or if you're wanting to lead more formally something or if, you just, or if it's just for your own study, you want God to guide your own heart, and you, you, you don't want to do it um, just in a devotional capacity, but you actually want to be guided through the scriptures in your own life, this is a great place for you. Um, let me know. Give me just by word of mouth. Let me know if you're interested in coming. So far, we've got about seven, eight people that are interested in coming. You're kind of, okay, Renee makes nine people that are interested in coming. So um, let me know just so I know. Um, how much material to print off and things like that. And, and I promise you, it sound, you know, hermeneutics sounds, it's a, sounds boring. It sounds kind of nosebleedy, you know. I promise it'll be fun. It, I will awaken the inner nerd in all of us, okay? Um, and then what else am I supposed to say? I think that's all I'm going to say for today. We have, we have a prayer team. We have a diaconate. You can look into all that. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 21. Oh, I am supposed to say something. Uh, maybe I'm not supposed to say something. Richard, did we, did we get the, the 29th figured out? Okay, I'm not supposed to say something. Okay, 1 Samuel 21. 1 Samuel chapter 21. We're moving ahead here. We're going to deal with this whole chapter today. So uh, let's, let's read it and then we'll dive right on in. Then David came to Nob to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech came to meet David trembling. And he said to him, Why are you alone and no one with you? And David said to Ahimelech the priest, The king has charged me with a matter and said to me, Let no one know anything of the matter about which I am about to send you and which I have charged you. So I have made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. In other words, I'm meeting my army of young men at such and such a place and at such and such a time. That's what David's saying. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever is here, actually. And the priest answered David, Well, I, I have no common bread on hand. There is only holy bread. If the young men have kept themselves from women... And David answered the priest, Truly, 
Women have been kept from us, as always, when I go on expedition. The vessels of the young men are holy. Even when it is, it's an ordinary journey, how much more today will their vessels be holy? So the priest gave him the holy bread, and there was no bread but, but the bread of the presence, which is, which is removed from before the Lord to be, placed by hot, to be replaced by hot bread on the day it is taken away. That's a, that's a clue that this is the Sabbath day. The bread was replaced on the Sabbath day. So David shows up here on the Sabbath. Verse 7, Now a certain man of the servant of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. His name was Doeg the Edomite, the chief of Saul's herdsmen. Then David said to Ahimelech, um, Then have you not here a, a sword or a, a spear on hand? For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. And the priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you struck down in the valley of Elah, Behold, it's wrapped in a cloth and behind the ephod. If you will take that, take it. And there is none, for there is nothing here but that. And David said, There is none like it. Give it to me. And David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, Is not this David, the king of the land? Did they not sing to one another of him in dances? Saul is struck down as thousands, and David is tens of thousands. And David took these words to heart and was very afraid of Achish, of Achish the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before, before them and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks on the doors of the gate and he let his spit run down his beard. Then Achish said to the servants, Behold, you see the man is mad, he's crazy. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen that you have brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? Shall this fellow... Come into, into my house. So David moved on from there. Let's pray. Jesus, I pray that you would guide us through this time together. I pray that you would give us wisdom to discern what you have for us today. Lord, as we humbly approach you with our hands open and our ears listening to receive and to hear what you would have for us today. Speak in that way that only you can, where you can apply an ancient text to our lives personally. We love you, Lord. And we release control. We're here to listen to you and to draw close to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we've been going through the life of David on Sunday mornings, and today marks a new chapter in his life, kind of a new epic in the life of David. Today marks the end of David's days in the king's court and being with the king and the beginning of David's wilderness years. Um, from, now on, from now until Saul's death, David will be living on the run, an enemy of the state, constantly looking over his shoulder, being hunted like an animal in the wilderness by the most powerful man in the land. The man that considers him to be the number one threat, both foreign and domestic, when it comes to Israel. Saul is bent on, on, David's, on David's destruction. Up until this point, David's been living a very difficult life, but a life in close proximity to the king. He's been in and around the king's courts, and there's kind of been a sense of um, I, you know, that David knows that Saul is, has these fits of rage, but David doesn't really know if it's about him necessarily. He's got his suspicions. And as things become more and more overt, as Saul begins to try to take David's life more and more overtly, um, David starts to become convinced that, that Saul is after him particularly. And so David goes to consult his best friend, Jonathan, who is also Saul's son and the heir apparent to the throne. And he goes to Jonathan and he says, what have I done? Your dad's out to get me. This is chapter 20. If you want to read it in detail, I'll just paraphrase it. But he comes to Jonathan and he says, what have I, what is your, why is your dad out to get me? What have I done? Tell me what I've done. And Jonathan says, I think this is all in your head because I am the closest advisor to my father. He surely would have told me if he was out to get you. I would know about this. And he hasn't said anything. And David says, no, 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 man, listen, your dad is trying to kill me. 
I, I feel like I'm, I'm one, this is a direct quote, I'm one step away from death. David's, he, you can feel his nerves on edge at this point. He's trying to convince Jonathan, no, it's, it's true. And Jonathan says, well, David says, here, let's, let's put forth a test to definitively know from this point forward if Saul has ill intentions for me. David says there's a feast coming up that all of the administration, including myself, all the generals are expected to be at before the king. It's this festival. I'm not going to show up. And when the king notices that I'm not there, if he mentions why isn't the son of, the son of Jesse not here, tell him that I had something going on in my own hometown and that my relatives begged me to come home for a feast in my own hometown and that you gave me permission. And let's see what his reaction was, what his reaction is. If he says, fine, great, hope he's blessed, well, then maybe it's in my head. Maybe this is just, I'm being paranoid. But if he flies off the handle and goes into a rage, let's just be clear between you and me. Now we know I can't come back. I can't come home. So it's this big pivotal moment because David's standing before him, he's standing on a precipice where he knows that depending on how this goes could change the outcome, the look of his life almost completely. And as the story goes, Saul doesn't say anything the first day of the feast. He just thinks maybe David's unclean. We talk, that theme of uncleanness is going to come into this chapter as well. Um, according to Leviticus if when you have intercourse, you are unclean for a certain amount of time, so you're to purify yourself before you come back and do these festivals and ceremonies. So perhaps David is unclean, he's been with his wife, and so he's going to abstain for the first day, but he doesn't show, the, show up the second day either, and so now Saul says something, where's the son of Jesse? And Jonathan says what he's supposed to say, oh, he came to me and he said his family wanted him to go celebrate a feast in, in in Bethlehem so he's off there doing that and Saul loses his ever loving mind I think for Jonathan this is probably a very surreal moment because all the suspicion it's finally come out have you ever have you ever had an experience like that where you might have suspected something about someone but then it just explodes out of them and what you suspected oh there it is it's right there there's no mistaking it now that's it's in the room. The monster's here. And Saul calls his son some horrible things. He insults the, his wife that conceived uh, uh, Jonathan. And Jonathan's just kind of turned around. He's like, Dad, what is, why are you against David? He's done nothing but bless you and help you. And, but Saul will not be uh, assuaged. He throws a spear at his own son at this point. Jonathan walks away so sad knowing that, okay, I've got to deliver the news to David that, what, that I was wrong and what, and what he feared so much is right. And he meets David and he, they hug, they embrace. This is probably the last time they ever saw each other. And David, for the first time, is alone. That's where we meet him today, alone. You know, loneliness. Genesis 2, 18. Before sin... God said about mankind, it's not good that mankind be alone. David's alone. Before he was in the palace, he had and he enjoyed widespread popularity. He had his wife, Michal, who was daughter's who was uh, Saul's daughter, who she loved him. He loved her. He had Jonathan there. Um, every time David went out and came back in, he was loved. Now, David, we're going to find he's going to go into a season of aloneness where he is not loved. He is hunted. This is the wilderness. Um, and I want to say, I'm, I'm going to entitle this sermon Into the Wild because the wilderness is one of the Bible's main descriptions for the life that you and I are living. Did you know that? The Bible uses over and over again the wilderness as the metaphor to describe what it is to live life in on this earth um, like the children of Israel who were passing through they were not where they used to be in Egypt but they weren't where they were um, supposed to be either they were passing through through the wilderness on their way to the promised land 
So likewise, we, the Bible would say, you and I, this life that you and I are living is a, is a wilderness experience. And I say that to you, first of all, just to prep you for this sermon, to, to know that um, this is actually one of the best ways that you can get through the wilderness is if you understand it is indeed a wilderness. Most people that I talk to that are frustrated with the things of this life have forgotten that it's a wilderness and are expecting this life to be more like heaven. This, when we're complaining about things that are breaking and diseases that are happening and hardships that are coming, and the Bible would say lovingly, gently, lovingly, but firmly, well, you're expecting this to be heaven. This is a wilderness. And the, what... Have you ever been camping before? Have you ever been through it? When the Bible uses the word wilderness, it's talking about a desert. And deserts are fun to move through. Maybe go visit, go on a hike. But the moment you decide that you're going to try to live there is the moment you begin to die. That is the moment you begin to die. The moment you think, this will be my home, and you stop moving. In other words, you've forgotten that it's a desert and uninhabitable, and you stop. You t try to take up roots. You try to find nutrients in a desert. That is the second that you begin to die. What keeps us alive is that we know that we're moving through. This is not our home. We're heading somewhere else. God's got, and therefore, we expect certain things in the desert. When you understand that you're going camping, you bring certain things that come with camping, like bug bites. You bring mosquito repellent because you're expecting to be sucked on, right? You, you, br you think, bring things to build a fire because you're expecting it to get cold. You bring your own source of water because you're not expecting to find water there and on and on it goes. You've got an expectation. But the, I think the people that probably hate camping the most are the people that are thinking this should be just like how it is at home. <laughs> and it's not. So we're going to learn some things about the wilderness today. There's, there's at least three things that we can learn about the wilderness and how this relates to your and my life directly. One is, David's going to learn some things. He's going to learn that the wilderness, number one, is dangerous. The wilderness is a dangerous place. Okay? Secondly, David's going to learn that the wilderness is messy. I'll explain that when we get there. It's messy. It's blurry. It's gray. Things don't necessarily fit the way he thinks they should. And thirdly, the wilderness, and I think most importantly for us to know, the wilderness is necessary. One, the wilderness is dangerous. Secondly, the wilderness is messy. And thirdly, the wilderness is absolutely necessary. First, look at the, there's danger throughout both of these episodes. We're dealing with two episodes in this chapter, and you can feel the danger on the page from almost the beginning. First of all, David comes to um, the town of Nob that the next chapter describes as a city of priests. Presumably, after Shiloh fell in the great battle with the Philistines back in chapter 6, and the ark, of the, the ark of the Lord was taken captive, presumably when Shiloh fell, the um, new place where God's people worshipped is the city Nob. It's where all the priests were about doing their work. And you've got to, um, first of all, notice something beautiful about David. He does something very David-like. When he's in trouble, when he's alone, when he's afraid, he naturally wants to go to where God's people are. He goes to Nob. I, he goes to church. I know a lot of you today, I talked to a few of you today, I thought, I'm on the right track for my sermon because a few of you today said, I was so lonely, but I forced myself to get out of bed and get here to be with God's people. Good job. That's Psalm 27. Psalm 27, David, is that famous prayer. He says, Lord, one thing I'm asking of you, this one thing that I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, that I might dwell with God's people. Man, if you're lonely, community, stay for lunch, be together, come to the Bible studies Tuesday and uh, you know, come to the hermeneutics class, even if you're not interested in learning the, how to study the Bible, come and just be with us. It's healthy. Well, David does that, but there's danger there. <clears throat> Even in, that, in a godly, priestly, holy place, there's danger there because Ahimelech, the priest, comes out. And did you notice it says that he's trembling with fear? 
He's trembling with fear. And there's a few different reasons why he could be scared that the text gives us some, some clues. First of all, he could be alarmed that David just came by himself. David at this point is known for being the star commander of the Israelite armies. And usually he's, you know, he's probably gone through Nob before to consecrate his army before going into a battle. And so Ahimelech has probably ran into David before and this time it's just unorthodox that David is alone and unarmed. It's just odd. So he, immediately he might be struck of what, what's going on here, what's happening. Another possibility, and this is one that I, I lean toward most, is that little clue in, in verse 7. Who is there? Doeg. An officer of King Saul is on site. And a lot of commentators and scholars wonder if this is kind of a, um, a veiled conversation between Ahimelech and, and David. In other words, Ahimelech comes out scared and he goes, why are you alone? In other words, because we're not. Like someone's here that could do you harm. That it's known that at this point that Saul is out looking for David. Perhaps Saul put a, a price on David's head or is starting to amass a search party. And maybe Ahimelech knows about this. And so he's giving David some clues. Don't know. What we know for sure is that Doeg, this officer of King Saul, is there. And he's not just any old officer. Later he's going to come back. He's a trained warrior and he by himself ends up killing an entire city of people he knows how to kill people this guy's a very dangerous man the next episode david goes for some reason he thinks it's a good idea david's young he he's um, maybe making not the greatest decisions based on fear he decides to leave israel and go into philistine territory and not just any old city from the Philistines, he goes to Gath. Gath is where Goliath is from. So David goes with the sword that he took Goliath's head off with. He goes with that sword into basically Goliath's hometown. Probably thinking, I don't think Saul will, come, will, will risk coming for me into Philistine territory. I'm prob He's probably thinking, Saul's my enemy. I've got to get out of here. Um, and he probably won't risk going that far into Philistine territory. And Gath was a border town right between Israel. In fact, it, was, it switches hands quite a bit. It becomes Israel, then it goes back to the Philistines. It's one of those towns. And he thinks, maybe I'll be safe there. But immediately he hears, and he's probably banking, maybe no one will recognize me with Goliath's sword. <laughs> I don't know. You know. And he hears them, singing, them saying, this is the, not only are they saying this is the guy that killed Goliath, but they're saying, this is the king of Israel. In other words, the very seditious, uh, the seditious saying that Saul is afraid of, the Philistines are already thinking of David as the king, as the one who's really in charge. And you read the text. David, it says, David took these words to heart and he was afraid. He was afraid. The first point just to relate it to us, is that life here in our wilderness is dangerous. If you haven't noticed, things happen. Dangerous things are capable of happening to you. In the wilderness, bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people. There's no law in the wilderness that decides who gets what? And so one of, the, one of the first things we can learn from this whole episode, that along with David, who's learning some things, is that it's a dangerous world out here. And I was reading about um, American sensibilities and Western culture in general, and I was reading about that our culture is by far, documentedly so, the weakest mentally in any recorded history. We are, the, we are, the, we are the, the least tolerant of pain and suffering than in, than in documented history. And part of the reason is because we are expecting, because we've had so many great years of, of affluence and success and we've enjoyed being a superpower and we've enjoyed all this technology and all of these things, because of all of those things, 
we kind of expect life to go a certain way for us. We've forgotten that we're not in the, the American dream, actually. That might be illusory. We're actually in a wilderness traveling through, and in the wilderness, things happen. Prices go up. Inflation happens. Diseases strike. Pandemics hit. The economy goes down. Um, hurricanes hit the coast. Droughts happen. There's food shortages. We don't want to go to work. We don't want to, all of these, these things affect us, and we, we beco- we've become, especially if you compare us to what, we, what you, we used to call the Great Generation, the World War II generation, coming right out of the Great Depression, one of the things that made that generation so mentally strong and tough was because they just came out of a Great Depression going into the war. They were used, they, they knew what it meant to be hungry. They knew what it meant to not have tomorrow guaranteed. And it gave them a certain level of toughness to them where they weren't expecting much. So when, when blessings happened to them, they were more grateful. They prized their things and their, their stuff and took care of them better. They were better stewards over their things. And this is very true of, even of their, of their children, of the, of the boomers. I, this is be my mom and, and uh, uh, you know, that generation. My mom is, if you know my mom, she's a, an extremely hard worker. She's very grateful for everything she has. All of her stuff is clean and taken care of and lasts as long as it possibly can. She's learned to save these types of things come from an idea that we don't know what today is guaranteeing. We do, there's suffering all around us, and therefore we can be grateful. And there's also a certain sense of toughness. Whereas we've now gone through, our generation has gone, this is what I was reading in the articles I was reading, we've gone through unprecedented blessing to where we, us younger folks, are not as used to suffering we're kind of expecting, well, we would call it being spoiled. We're kind of expecting what we deserve, life to be handed to us. And therefore, when things happen, we're a lot, we're a lot more weak. We forget that life is actually quite dangerous. And so when things hit, we're, we're, when things hit us, we're way more shocked than other people that in, the, in, in the East, Africa, China, uh, the third world, all of those places, we're a lot more shocked. Uh, I think I might have shared this before, but Nicole and I have a friend that came over from Africa, and she was working in the medical field, and she had come over for dinner, and we asked her, so what, do you, what have you noticed to the difference between Africa and here? And she said, well, I don't want to be insulting, but, um, well, one thing I've noticed is the, the blessings you guys have, and just the technology, and, and and there's so much opportunity for me here that I never had in Africa. I, I, it's just amazing the opportunity. She said, but I've also noticed that there's a lot more shock when, it, when, when death happens in particular. She said, where I'm from, death is an everyday thing. She goes, for example, back home when a woman d- finds out that she's pregnant... It is both, at the same moment, both a time of excitement and joy and a time of sorrow and sadness in one shot because we know that chances are either her or the baby, one of them will not survive the birth. That's the majority of, of those chances. Just here, you know, guys don't have that problem because of technology and your blessings, but it's kind of made folks a little weak in their mind because they're, expect, they're, they're expecting it. For us, she goes, literally the day before I came, or a week before I came, I walked out my door and there was a dead body. I had to step over it <laughs> to get to where I was going. John Wesley also commented on this. I was reading one of his sermons and he said, the gospel is its weakest in the most affluent societies. He said, the gospel is the weakest in the most affluent societies. Why? Well, because we were not in touch with our great need. We have everything provided for us. We've got several options before we have to cry out to God in absolute need and humility. If we're out of money, we can put it on a credit card or we can apply for a loan or we've, or we've got 
a whole bunch of programs, which are all blessings. They're all good. But with those blessings come a certain temptation to expect those blessings in, in return. One thing that the Bible reminds us over and over and over and over and over and over again, that life is a wilderness and it's dangerous. And therefore, one of the, one of the things that we can employ to get through it is just to realize that life is a wilderness and when things happen, we won't be so shocked. We might be crushed or we might be, yeah, crushed but not destroyed. We might be hurt but not broken. We might be disappointed but not overthrown, not overtaken because this is the life that we live in. And I think we're starting to get more and more in that for the last couple of years. I think we're start, that's starting to dawn on us more and more. Several of you are through, going through a wilderness time now and the first thing that we learned here is, first, to n- number one, know that you're not abnormal, you're not unique, you're not weird, you're in a wilderness, and those things happen. Not to minimize what you're going through. Not that it makes it any less traumatic. All of those things. But realize, first, take the disappointment away that this is not heaven. This, we're, we're at war. Okay? Secondly, notice how messy this is. Here's what I mean by that. Did you notice that David lies in both episodes? In the first episode, um, he comes to Ahimelech, and Ahimelech says, what are you doing? You're all by yourself. How come you're alone? And David comes up with this elaborate lie that the king has sent him on some secret clandestine mission, and that he's meeting his army, and therefore I need some bread and I need some weapons. And in doing this, he, well, and in the next episode, he goes, to not, or he goes to Achish, the king of Gath, and he feigns being insane to get himself out of harm's way. With Ahimelech, the priest, when he comes out to meet David, David accomplishes two things through his deception. First, it gave Ahimelech the impression that David was still doing the king's business and would relieve him about helping David. He would get the help that he needs. Secondly, it was a way of protecting Ahimelech. If he he told Ahimelech outright the truth, actually Saul's trying to kill me and I'm on the run, one, Ahimelech might not be inclined, and reasonably so, be inclined not to help David. Or secondly, if he helped him, he would be doing it at great threat to to his own life. David's trying to protect him here, and unfortunately, this is so messy because it doesn't work out. Later, well, in the next chapter, this Doeg does hear about it, rats Ahimelech out. Ahimelech tells the truth, and he, you know, he offers deniability. I didn't know. This is what David said. Saul is so paranoid and enraged that he orders Doeg to kill Ahimelech, and Doeg actually kills the entire town of the priests in the name of Saul. It doesn't work out the way David thinks it would. It's, 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 messy thing. it's messy stuff. This is where the Bible talks a lot about, um, the Bible will, unfor- to a lot of our consternation, the Bible does not give a set of, all the time, a set of black and white rules by which to live by. A lot of people will, one of the fir- if you come to the hermeneutics class, one of the first things that we will debunk is that the Bible is basic instructions before leaving earth. Have you heard that acronym before to describe the Bible? That's wrong and ridiculous and silly. It's actually not. It's not like a, a, like a driver's manual where you can go and, to whatever situation that, that you're about and you can flip to, okay, what college should I go to? Who should I marry? You know, all of those things, and the Bible's going to tell you. It's not that way. Um, the Bible is actually trying to give you something that the Bible calls wisdom. And the, but what the Bible means by wisdom is to give you a character and to know the Lord's character in such a way that you can live wisely in the, in the 80% of life where the Bible has nothing to say about it. <laughs> that's, that's the idea. And you come against things in life, in the desert and in the wilderness, that don't have a, that are kind of gray, blurry areas ethically. I think of the Egyptian midwives, extraordinary situations, the Egyptian midwives that were commanded by Pharaoh to kill 
the Hebrew women, or the, excuse me, the Hebrew uh, male children that were being born to the Hebrew women, and they didn't. And they said, well, they, these Hebrew women are just so healthy, they gave birth before we could even show up. Well, I think of Rahab, who hid the Israelite spies in her room, the prostitute in Jericho that hid the Israelite spies in her room and lied about their whereabouts so that Israel could come and overtake her own city. I think of one of my favorite go-tos for this is Dietrich Bonhoeffer, an incredible Christian minister who lived in, who, from Germany, lived in Germany during World War II and actively and intentionally took part in an assassination attempt against Hitler and he wrote later that it was my Christian duty to lie and to try to take him out. The point is, is that times in the wilderness, there are situations that don't fit our boxes of where things should be. And you've, at that point, you've got to use things like wisdom. How do we figure this out? Well, interestingly enough, Jesus, Jesus used this situation to describe his own um, way of living wisely. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus says, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat against the rules. So Jesus, like David, is also there on a Sabbath day. The rules say you you don't work on the Sabbath. It's strictly you rest. You rest with God on the Sabbath day. Well, um, Jesus' disciples are hungry, and because they knew Jesus would be okay with it and not call them out on it, they began to harvest, they began to pick off the heads of grain and eat and fill themselves because they were starving. But the Pharisees saw it and they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful. They're against the law on the Sabbath. And he said to them, here's where he references our passage. He says, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence which was not lawful for him to eat, nor, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are, and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what it means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would have, you would have, uh, you would have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is saying, how do we guide ourselves in conduct in those, these gray situations throughout life? He says, well, let mercy be your guide. Compassion on others. Like in David's case, at least the first episode with uh, Ahimelech, he's trying to protect Ahimelech. He's trying to protect him from an onslaught and trying to protect that city, which unfortunately doesn't work out. So he lies and doesn't tell the truth. He conceals what's really going on for the protection of someone else. And sometimes we find ourselves in those extraordinary situations here in the wilderness. I'm not condoning lying. I'm not. I'm just saying this is the nature of life. We find ourselves in in places quite a bit. A lot of life is gray where we find ourselves in places where the rules don't perfectly apply. Situations health problems, health situations, that people have to make some really, really hard decisions based on mercy and not sacrifice, not strict obedience. Those of us who are more immature in our faith will use this principle as license to justify doing whatever we want. And that's a a sign of immaturity. But those of us that are walking with Jesus and understand that we go through situations that are not necessarily um, clean cut, especially when it comes scripturally, we've got to think about what Jesus' heart. We have to know his attitude toward folks and how he would help. Um, When I was a young pastor... Younger than now, because I'm not old. Let's get that straight right now. (laughs) I met a young man who was bipolar and was um, uh, possibly suffering from schizophrenia and those types of things. But because he heard a teacher tell him that it's not right to take medication 
that it's sinful to take medication, he refused to do it. Because he, and you know, to this young man's credit, he loved Jesus that much. He wanted to do what he thought was right. He, he was like, man, if the Lord tells me not to take medication and that it's of the devil, well, then I'm going to not take medication. And, and, you know, I had to go rescue him off the streets. I had to call port authority and tell them not to let him get on a plane because he was not thinking straight. He was not right. And I had to call his teacher and find the curriculum that taught him according a, a, apparently in the Bible that taking medication is wrong, I had to take that and take him through my own Bible study and dismantle what he had learned so that I could show him what was right according to wisdom because compassion would say, God provided this. Take it. It will provide some clarity. Some, some, it will provide some direction, some relief. But because someone had said, no, the Bible says this, and they didn't know the heart behind Jesus. And I'm happy to report the end of the story is great. He's, he's doing really well. I've, I ran into him about a year ago, and he's doing fantastic. And he's found a perfect uh, balance for his medication. And his life isn't perfect, but he's doing a lot better. And he's living a great, successful, healthy, in love with Jesus life, serving at a local church. Areas like that, we've got to use wisdom and mercy to be our guide and to know Jesus that well. Finally... Lastly, the wilderness is necessary. The wilderness is necessary. It's not just, a ne I really need you to know this, it's not just inevitable. God is using your wilderness. It's necessary. David is not, um, so he, let me clue you into this, this holy bread situation here. Um, well, let me ask you this. What is the Bible? I just told you what the Bible is not. The Bible is basic instruction. The Bible is not basic instructions before leaving Earth, right? It's not where you find a recipe for a, for bread. <laughs> if you've been in the store and you see Ezekiel four nine bread, read that whole passage and get a good chuckle for yourself, okay? Because uh, you know the advertisement is that they use that to get their recipe for bread. I hope I sure hope not, because one of the recipes in that passage is human poop. So I sure hope, if it is, don't buy that bread. That's all I'm saying. Don't buy the bread. But, you know, um, I had one person tell me I, he was trimming some, he was trimming a tree, an olive tree, and he was doing a great job. He's an arborist, loved the Lord. And I said to him, where did you learn to trim trees like that? And he's a well-meaning guy, he, but he said, you know, from reading the Bible. And I went, huh, show me in the Bible where there's instructions on how to trim a tree properly. And I know what he meant. He meant the Spirit is leading him and that God is with him right now. And he meant well. But it gives a false impression that the Bible is some kind of manual that will tell you how to buy a car, who to marry, how to make bread, all of those types of things. Where the Bible itself would not, does not present itself in that way. The Bible is, we've gone over this before, um, the Bible is progressive but recursive Ancient Eastern meditation literature. Okay, that's a lot to unpack, but that's what the Bible is. It is progressive recursive, which means it's going somewhere, but recursive means it revolves back. It revolves. It's, always, it's constantly pointing both backwards and forwards at the same time. The best analogy that I can think of is that the Bible is like a snowball. And as it progresses, it picks up more momentum around some of its main themes. So the Bible is written in a way, if you understand this, the Bible is written in such a way to make your brain remember things that you've already read and to think of something coming in the future at the same time. If you're reading the Bible correctly, your brain will both think you're heading somewhere because it's a story most of the Bible is a narrative genre. It's a story moving you somewhere with a plot and all of those types of things. Plots and characters and uh, antagonists and protagonists and all, all of those things are there. But it's recursive in that it's going to take a theme that it brought up before and it's going to bring it up again but with more substance to that same theme this time. Okay? 
So when you're reading, if your brain goes, oh, this reminds me of that one story, I'm here to tell you that is intentional. That's not a coincidence, that's intentional. What is, with that in mind, what does this story remind you of? I've already alluded, to, I've, I've already alluded you to it once, but I'm wondering, what does this story remind you of? Let me set it up. David is promised to be king. He's been made a promise to be king. But before he gets to the promise to be king, David goes into the wilderness for a season before he gets to the promise. Children of Israel, after they were taken out of where? Egypt. They were given, where were they going? To a promised land. And what did they get in the wilderness? What happened to them? How did, how did they eat in the wilderness? Anybody? Manna, which is holy bread from heaven, right? The story in the life of David is written in parallel that, for that very reason. It's not an accident. It's very intentional. Here David goes into the wilderness where he's alone. He needs provision and he provides sustenance, holy bread in the wilderness for, uh, that sustains him. <clears throat> later, well, I think I'll bring that up later. What's the point? That for the children of Israel... One of the lessons that you learn from going back in the, uh, to thinking, why the, one of the reasons the author is trying to hearken your mind back to the children of Israel is because any good Israelite would know that not only was the wilderness um, in some ways inevitable, but it was necessary. Did you know that there was a quicker route to get to the promised land than they took? But God purposely led Moses the long way through the wilderness for how, many, how long? 40 years because they needed that time in the wilderness to hone them and make them ready for the promised land. And that's exactly what's, what the author is trying to tell you about David here, that there's a divine sending into the wilderness to prepare him to be the king. David has already been declared the man after God's own heart. That's been ha he is the man after God's own heart, but he's no king yet. He's got to go into the wilderness to be a king. He's got to learn a few things to be a king. He's got to learn to, to depend on God to be a king, especially to not be the kind of king Saul was. Saul was anointed king. He had no wilderness time. He was immediately, almost immediately appointed king. And as one writer, commentator puts it, especially he's an expert on the life of David, he says um, God put David in the wilderness to get the Saul out of David. In other words, to stop, Saul, to, to stop David from becoming the same kind of king that Saul was. He had to teach him to depend on God, to release. What's, what's, Saul, what's ruining Saul right now? Control, control, control. It's me, it's me. I have to, I have to, I have to. It's all up to me. It's all up to me. The best remedy for that is to put you in a situation where you have zero control of your life. A wilderness. And actually, in our wilderness, in our life, we have, we have a lot less control than we typically think. Most of the control that we think we have in life is, is illusory. We have no control over what Vladimir Putin decides to do. What Vladimir Putin decides to do or what, how the world decides to respond we have really little control over things like that, which means we have really little control over the economy. We have really little control over the market. We have really little control over if our, if our company can afford to keep us on or not or give us the raise that we need to keep up with inflation. We have little control over all of those things. We have very little control if our bodies uphold the test of time, if we get sick or if we get hurt or all of those types of things. We have little control if our cars last. We have little control if our houses break down. We have very little control in life for the most part. Very little control. And here the Bible reminds us that not only is, is it inevitable that we're in a wilderness, it's also necessary. God is at hand in this in you, making you into the promises that he's, that he's given to you. And that, to me, makes the wilderness very exciting. If I know that God 
is answering my prayers for patience, for character, for honesty, for work ethic, for compassion, for love. If I know that God is answering those prayers, that I could to be less selfish. And he says, okay, Mike, I'm gonna, it's wilderness time. I'm preparing you for something. Then it makes it durable. I know that God is in everything. That's what the Bible says in Philippians. It says, for the Lord is at hand. That means not that he's about to return, although I think that might be true and I hope it's true. But it literally means the Lord is in everything. And I would say especially the, heart, the, the wildernesses, the hard things. Leading us with a pillar of fire and, a, and his presence at night. He's leading us through all the hardships. He's in the hardships. He's doing something in you through all of your wilderness experiences. Let me encourage your heart. He, the Bible says he's doing something in you that far surpasses the weight of any value you put on any of these external things. Whether it be your job, your comfort, your future. Who knows what your future is going to be. Whether it be a circumstance in the present or however it's going to work, there's something happening in you that God, no matter how dangerous it is or how messy it all is, whether you handle it right or you handle it wrong, whether David's right or wrong about feigning insanity to the, to the king of, of, of uh, Gath, that, the jury's out on that. Scholars go both ways on that. I don't know. But one thing I know, God is doing something in David through this. Now, here's what I want to ask you. How do you know? How can you guarantee, well, let me qualify this. God is doing something in you through the wilderness if, if you cooperate. Because let's be real. Let's be real. We all know people who have gone into the storms of life and some have come out better and some have come out worse. Let's be real. Let's be real. The children of Israel, the generation that was in the wilderness, most of them died in that wilderness. Only a few of them got to go into the promised land. So let me just put the fine print out there. How, do you, how can you guarantee that the wilderness that you're going through is going to make you better, not bitter? Is going to make you blessed and not worse. That's going to build you up instead of tear you apart. How can you become a person of greatness? How can you become so buoyant in a storm where you float through? How do you do it? Well, look at David. David, look what he says here. Ahimelech says, I have no bread on hand. There's only holy bread. If the young men have kept themselves from women... That's an issue of cleanness. I want, I want to make a distinction to you. Cleanness. And David went a little... He, he, he said, I'll do you one better. Truly, women have been kept from us, as always, on expedition. And then he goes, one better. The vessels of the young men are holy. Holy and cleanness are not the same thing. Very different in the Bible. Okay? Cleanness is what you do to become acceptable to God. Holy. Does anybody know what holy means? Besides my students that are here, does anybody know what, what holy means? Set apart, that's typically how it's, how it's um, translated, and partially yes. There's a better word that, talks, that gives us a better definition of holiness, and it's the word dedicated or devoted to. Dedicated or devoted to. So when Isaiah sees... God in the temple and his vision in chapter 6, high and lifted up, and the seraphim are crying out, holy, holy, holy. They're saying, and Isaiah's written to people who are, remember, what, what's, what's Isaiah's response? He says, woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live in a land of unclean lips. You know what he's saying? The scene is, devoted, devoted, devoted to a people who are unclean. That's the mess, and that's the whole book of Isaiah. That's the message. You can outline the whole book of Isaiah through chapter 6. It's a God who is devoted and dedicated to an unclean, sinful, rejecting people. 
Here, David is saying, well, and what does God say to us? He says, be you holy, dedicated as I am holy. In other words, I want you to be as dedicated to me as I am to you. That's what holiness, different from being clean, different. Both essential, but different. There were, in the temple, there were objects like this bread, but also vessels. Uh, David mentions these vessels. There were vessels that were not just clean. They had to be clean. They did. But they weren't just clean. They were then sprinkled with blood, which meant they were consecrated. They were dedicated uh, only to God. You could not use these vessels in any other purpose. They were dedicated only to God. So there's a... There's a, a, a an idea of exclusivity with the idea of being holy. So here's the idea. Here's the theological idea. You as Christians have been made clean, but the wilderness is what makes you holy. You are in the process of becoming fully sharpened and dedicated, devoted to Yahweh. And that, my friends, only comes through hardship. What David is referring to here when he's saying that he and his men are holy, uh, in those days when, when he would go out to war with his men, he would stop by Nob and they would consecrate them because they were going on a holy war. That's the idea here. David's men, his, as a commander and his army, are holy. In other words, they are dedicated not to looting and plundering, not to the nation, not to those things. They're dedicated to God in this holy mission. Yeah, Michael? Yes. Yes. Yes, Michael just said something brilliant, and he was talking about, in Hebrews, it talks of Jesus, that Jesus was made perfect through his suffering. And it's the same idea, that through a wilderness, we are honed and made dedicated. So here's the thing, David right now, he's a, he's a lot like us. He says, yes, I'm holy. In other words, I'm fully dedicated. But it takes a wilderness to find out where our idols truly lie. A lot of us, I don't know, when you first became a Christian, you no doubt had maybe an emotional moment where you said, okay, yes, I'm holy, I'm dedicated, I'm in, I'm devoted, I'm in. And you meant it, you know, as far as you're on the conscious level, but underneath there, you have other loves, non-negotiables, requirements, things that you can't imagine doing life without, a level of wanting control. And on and on it goes. That, you, that are under the surface. You can't see them with the conscious eye. They're semi-conscious or subconscious. Um, and s- the storms of life. You know what they do? They shake up the sea bottom. So that the stuff being held on the ground comes up and floats up to the surface. The wilderness shows you what's really there. So God can skim it away and make you the king that he's promised you to be. And this, of course, remember what I said, the Bible points backwards, children of Israel, Egypt, good job, Phil. How does the Bible point forward? When was the greater greater than David in a wilderness? Jesus, yes. When was he in a wilderness? Yes, the Spirit led him into the wilderness, right? Right? What happened? When did he provide bread in a wilderness? When did he provide bread to people in a wilderness? The feeding of the 5,000. Good job, Kristen. Gold star. Ten points to Fornax. You know, where Jesus is there in the wilderness, and he feeds the 5,000. Remember the the story? And then he says some extremely controversial things. This is John chapter 6. He says, you know the, the bread that was given by Moses in the wilderness? I am that bread. It's me. And whoever eats of this, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood will enter into the kingdom of God. And this was crazy to hear. Obviously. 
And at that point, John chapter 6, verse 66, easy one to remember, John 666, the crowds, his followers, left at the, that hard saying. And Jesus turned to his disciples at that moment and said, are you going to leave too? And they said, where else can we go? For only you have the words of life. You see what's going on here? Jesus is saying, I'm the bread. I'm the one that makes you holy. How does Jesus make you holy? By realizing that he was the bread that was broken. He went through his own wilderness to get to the resurrection. The night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he ripped it in front of his disciples, in front of his friends. And he said, this is my body ripped for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And this, is my, this represents my blood poured out for you. Drink this in remembrance of me. In other words, remember, this, I went through a wilderness. I'm not asking you to do anything that I haven't done myself. And to the degree that you ingest this bread, this holy bread, ingest my gift for you, to that degree, you will be in your own wilderness, you will be made better, not bitter. It will make you great. It will make you a person of greatness. You'll be, you'll, you'll, you'll have the fire that refines around you. If you realize, to, that you realize that Jesus went through his own cross, he went through the wilderness to get to his promised land, to get to the resurrection. In other words, we're following our Savior, and there's something redemptive in it. If you are going through a storm or a wilderness, I'm mixing my metaphors, but same idea. If you're going through a wilderness, you're in good company. You're in good company. Not only is it dangerous, yes, know that, it is dangerous. Living life is fraught with danger. It's not for the weak of heart. You're about to go out those doors, and things may not go the way you want them to go. It's a wilderness out there. Your kids, God forbid, God forbid can get hurt, or they could leave the faith. You could get an altering disease that changes the whole way you think about life. Your career could be pulled out right from underneath of you. All of those things, I cannot tell you, I should not tell you, I will not tell you that if you follow the Lord, your life will be just peachy. No, because the Lord that we're following himself said, follow me. And his life was a life of sorrow, grief, hardship, homelessness, abuse. He was a, he was a victim of injustice. Shame, he died nakedly on a cross. Everyone could laugh at him, make fun of him. He was separated from his father. He, was, he died on that cross alone. He knows what cosmic loneliness is like. Remember what he said on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me? Why? So that you could ingest the story and know that you're not alone. And know that just as God brought redemption to the world through that act, through that wilderness, he's bringing redemption and health and wholeness to your life and those around you as you bear your cross. As you bear your cross, it's necessary. He's doing something in you. David will become the pinnacle king for Israel. There will never be, until Jesus, there will never be a king quite like David, a man after God's own heart like David, who ruled so well, who unified the kingdom, who brought an end to Israel's enemies, who loved the Lord with all of his heart and followed him with all of his soul, who purged the land of foreign gods. All of this, none of that would be if it wasn't for this refining wilderness. You are becoming something too. The Bible says God is refining you into the image of Christ. If you want to know what's going on in you, you are becoming more like Christ and it takes a wilderness to get you there. Let's all stand up.
can you close your eyes, have a moment to yourself, you and the Lord. And think of the dangers of your wilderness. Just take a moment. Are there any dough eggs in your camp? What makes you tremble? The first message to you is that those dangers are real. God doesn't say, oh, get over it, they're fine. No. What are those things? Who are those people? What are those situations that are making you tremble? Let's, let's bring them up. Same thing, when your eyes are closed, think of the confusing areas in life, the messiness. The areas where, you know, you can't find a perfect Bible verse to just tell you exactly what to do. It's okay just to sit there in that. Just bring them up. Maybe there's some actions in your life that like the commentators with David, they don't know if it's good or bad. The jury's still out. Did I do what was right there? Did I do what was wrong? I don't know. And then as we take communion, think of it as your way of saying, I'm dedicated to you because I see that you're dedicated to me even in the midst of the danger, even in the midst of the messiness, in the midst of my mistakes and the confusing time, I serve a holy, devoted, dedicated God. And I'm committed. And you're making me holy. So you know what communion is gonna do today? It's going to bless your wilderness. And I want you to participate. When you take communion today, when you partake of Jesus' wilderness, it's a sacrament. I want you in your mind to bless your situations. I'm not saying that you'll have a solution. I'm not saying that they'll turn out well. They're still dangerous. They're still messy. But God is doing something powerful in the midst of your wilderness. Form those things in your mind and come up when you're ready and apply the cross to those things and embrace it. Ingest it. That's why he said, eat this. Let it become a part of you. Embrace the wilderness because it's redemptive, it's preparatory, it's preparing you for something. The night that he was betrayed, he took, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Earlier he said, follow me. The same way he took the cup and he said, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink it in remembrance of me. Follow me. When you've got those things in your mind, come up and take it and bless your wilderness. covers your throne 
It's like a rainbow, like a rainbow. And here I find myself in the sweetest embrace. It's a love that I could never earn. And it's only in this place that I am truly safe. Surrender to beauty untold. Your mercy, it covers me wherever I go. And your kindness, it never ends, oh There's nothing I could do to change your mind about me. And mercy it flows from your throne like a river, like a river. Here I find myself in this healing embrace. It's a love like I have never known. And it's only in this place that I am truly safe, surrendered to beauty untold. Your mercy, it covers me. Wherever I go, and your kindness it never ends, oh Lord. There's nothing I could do to change your mind, God. There's nothing I could do to change your mind about me. Keep you from loving me, to keep you from wanting me, Jesus. Your love will never fail. Your love will never fail. Your love it never fails me. It does sustain me. You are the bread of life. You are the bread of life. And there's nothing I could do to change your mind. God, there's nothing I could do to change your mind. No, there's nothing I could do to change your mind about me. He's dedicated to you. He's devoted to you 100%. He'll never leave you, never forsake you. Thank you, Lord. Because you're a good, good father and you love your children slow to anger, abounding in love. You're oh so gracious and oh so merciful how you love, how you love us all. Thank you, Lord. Lord, thank you for your mercy. Thank you that you are so devoted and dedicated. And you're making us more and more devoted to you. Thank you that you've made us clean. Lord, we want to be wholly yours, just as you are wholly ours. 
Thank you for doing that and answering our prayers, even though it comes through some difficulty, some real difficult times. Lord, we look to you because we're, we're passing through this wilderness. So we come to you for our bread, our direction, our guidance. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, God bless you guys, and God bless this food we're about to eat. Stick around, please. Help us put some chairs away, and then also we'll get some, get some tables out, and we'll start eating this pulled pork yummy sandwiches or jackfruit, whatever your preference.